Why the Universe is Made for Life Sir Martin Rees is Professor of Cosmology and Astrophysics at the University of Cambridge, Master of Trinity College, former President of the Royal Society, and the current Astronomer Royal. Rees has spent much of his life on the question of why the universe is suited for life. He authored one of the first papers on the subject, wrote a book on it, and even hosted a television show exploring the topic. In his book, Just Six Numbers, Rees describes three known answers to the question of why the universe is finely tuned for life. Coincidence We're just incredibly lucky, and there is no explanation or reason. Providence Our universe was designed, chosen, or created to allow life. Multiverse There are many universes, most are barren, but some permit life. Let's consider the implications for each of these answers. Coincidence However small it may be, there is a chance that there is a single universe, neither designed, nor one of many, which just happens to have physical laws and constants that are life-permitting. Perhaps, things are not so hopeless for life as we estimated. It might be that life finds a way in a large fraction of possible universes. If so, then we shouldn't be so surprised? But there are reasons to doubt this. Life requires a special environment. Life must be capable of maintaining, repairing, copying, and mutating its information patterns. The environment must allow life to arise and self-assemble and also self-replicate. Across possible environments, few appear to support both needs. Most seem to miss the necessary balance between simplicity and chaos. If the environment is too simple, there's no hope of getting self-arising, self-replicating forms. If the environment is too chaotic, there's no hope of preserving information across generations. John von Neumann created the first self-replicating machine. It was designed to operate within a cellular automaton, a specially crafted environment having its own set of rules, i.e. its own laws of physics. But in the set of possible cellular automata, only a small fraction has the right balance of complexity and stability to support self-replication. Quote, It seems plausible that, even in the space of cellular automata, the set of laws that permit the emergence and persistence of complexity is a very small subset of all possible laws, the point is that, however many ways there are of being interesting, there are vastly many more ways of being trivially simple or utterly chaotic. End quote. Luke A. Barnes in The Fine Tuning of the Universe for Intelligent Life, 2011. As Richard Dawkins put it, however many ways there may be of being alive, it is certain that there are vastly more ways of being dead. Even in a life-friendly universe like ours, we find ourselves in a very special place. Most of the universe is intergalactic space. A cold, dark, void, having just one hydrogen atom per cubic meter. Our environment is some 10 to the power of 30 times denser than average. As Max Tegmark noted, only a thousandth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of our universe lies within a kilometer of a planetary surface. It's doubtful life could arise in the near vacuum of intergalactic space, nor is it likely to exist in the hot cores of planets or stars. Most of our universe is inhospitable. Life can't always find a way. Earth is a lone Eden. Trillions of miles sit between her and the nearest, plausibly hospitable, locations. Kepler 22b, which may have liquid water, is 6,000 trillion kilometers away. The rarity of life in the universe speaks to how uncommon life may be across the set of possible universes. Even where life is known to be possible it appears to be exceedingly rare. See, are we alone? The sensitivity of life to the smallest changes in the fundamental constants further suggests it takes a rare mix of particles, forces, and initial conditions working together to make a universe with life. Quote. 
it is logically possible that parameters determined uniquely by abstract theoretical principles just happen to exhibit all the apparent fine tunings required to produce, by a lucky coincidence, a universe containing complex structures. But that, I think, really strains credulity. End quote. Frank will check in Physics Today, 2006. But if incredible luck is not the answer, then someone, or something, must have set things up just right. Providence. Divine providence is another possible answer to the mystery. This is the belief that the universe was designed and created with intention. Perhaps to be interesting, to support the existence of intelligent life. Fred Hoyle, who had been a lifelong atheist, was led by his discovery of the carbon-12 excited state to believe in a super-calculating intellect who must have designed the properties of the carbon atom. In this, he is not alone. Arno Penzias, who discovered the cosmic hum of the Big Bang, said astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say supernatural, plan. Quote. A life-giving factor lies at the center of the whole machinery and design of the world. End quote. John Archibald Wheeler in Forward to the Anthropic Cosmological Principle, 1986. If there is one universe, with one set of laws, divine providence is a natural conclusion. So many bullets were dodged in the many fine tunings that it all being a coincidence doesn't hold water. While some physicists were open to this possibility, most were unsettled by it. Fine tunings suggest a fine tuner. But once a deity is invoked as part of an explanation, further scientific progress halts, as any line of inquiry can be answered with, it was God's plan. Quote, this is a dislike of mixing religion into physics. I think they were somewhat afraid that if it was admitted that the reason the world is the way it is has to do with our own existence, that that could be hijacked by the creationists, by the intelligent designers. And of course what they would say is yes, we always told you so. There is a benevolent somebody way up high in the universe who created the universe exactly so that we could live. I think physicists shrank at the idea of getting involved in such things. End quote. Leonard Susskind in What We Still Don't Know, Are We Real? 2004. But the claim that creation or a creator is unscientific is now in doubt. Today's scientists have already wet their toes in the area of creating universes. They do so in highly detailed computer simulations. Simulation is indispensable to today's scientists. It enables them to create, experiment with, and explore cosmic evolution. It allows us to see inside the cores of collapsing stars, and understand the physics of alternate universes with different constants or initial conditions. The cosmologist Alan Guth even thinks it is possible in principle to create and split off an entire new physical universe in the laboratory. Quote, the odd thing is that you might even be able to start a new universe using energy equivalent to just a few pounds of matter. Provided you could find some way to compress it to a density of about 10 to the 75th power grams per cubic centimeter, and provided you could trigger the thing, inflation would do the rest. Such an achievement is obviously far beyond our technology, but some advanced civilization in the distant future might. Well, you never know. For all we know, our own universe may have started in someone's basement. End quote. Alan Guth in Physicist aims to create a universe, literally, 1987. If our universe is the result of such an experiment, or if it exists as a simulation performed by a higher being or species, then our universe is life-friendly because of the providence of our Creator. The particular constants and laws would have been chosen with intention. See, are we living in a computer simulation? And is it possible to create new universes? But even if this is the case, 
the mystery still remains. How did the simulator or universe creator come to be? If the creator arose through natural processes, the universe hosting the creator would also have to have been finely tuned. It pushes the question back one step, but does not ultimately answer it. Though we cannot rule out providence as an explanation, this solution raises as many questions as it answers. Scientists wanting to progress on the mystery of fine-tuning sought a naturalistic explanation. Multiverse If we are not exceedingly lucky, and if our universe was not designed, there is one alternative, many, perhaps even an infinite number of universes exist. There will be life in some, and not in others. Quote. We imagine our universe to be unique, but it is one of an immense number, perhaps an infinite number, of equally valid, equally independent, equally isolated universes. There will be life in some, and not in others. In this view the observable universe is just a newly formed backwater of a much vaster, infinitely old, and wholly unobservable cosmos. If something like this is right, even our residual pride, pallid as it must be, of living in the only universe is denied to us. End quote. Carl Sagan in Pale Blue Dot, 1994. Under the multiverse explanation, our universe is just one of a much larger set of other, equally real universes. Each of these universes may be ruled by different physics, different forces, constants, particle types, dimensionality, and so on. Most universes won't have rules of a kind necessary for life. They will be empty? No one will be there to appreciate the splendor. How many other universes might there be? While we have no way to know the exact number of extant universes, it's possible to estimate the minimum. It is equivalent to asking, how many lottery tickets are needed to have a good chance of winning? The answer, more than the inverse of the likelihood that a single ticket is a winner. So if the odds per ticket are 1 in a 100 million, you need around a 100 million tickets for a high chance of winning. Let's use this same logic to consider how many universes are needed to make up for the unlikelihood of a lambda falling in a life-friendly range, whose improbability was on the order of 1 in 10 to the power of 120. Quote. Weinberg's approach for explaining the cosmological constant only works if we're part of a multiverse in which there are a huge number of different universes, their cosmological constants must fill out some 10 to the power of 124 distinct values. Only with that many different universes is there a high likelihood that there's one with a cosmological constant that matches ours. End quote. Brian Green in The Hidden Reality, 2011 this number, 10 to the power of 124, is far greater than the number of atoms in the observable universe, estimated to be 10 to the power of 80. Where does all this stuff come from? Is the multiverse theory even scientific when we cannot observe or interact with these other universes? As Paul Davis said, invoking an infinity of unseen universes to explain the unusual features of the one we do see is just as ad hoc as invoking an unseen creator. But as Max Tegmark points out, the idea of parallel universes is not a theory, but a prediction made by several existing theories, which are themselves testable and falsifiable, and thus scientific. Examples include Cosmic Inflation which suggests eternal inflation, a reality populated with an exponentially growing number of Big Bangs, with new universes perpetually created for all time. String theory, which suggests a string theory landscape, having at least 10 to the power of 500 unique sets of physical laws, with different particle types, and fundamental constants. Quantum mechanics, whose Schrödinger equation, taken at face value, implies unseen parallel worlds, a quantum multiverse, with branches constantly diverging from our own to explore all possibilities. See, does everything that can happen, actually happen? 
Independent of the search for answers to fine-tuning, various fields of science are increasingly pointing in the direction of many universes, a multiverse. In 1996, Tegmark went one step further. In his mathematical universe hypothesis, he put forward the idea that the equations of string theory may not be the only equations that can define universes. According to his radical idea, equations of string theory represent just one of an infinite number of self-consistent physical equations, and all consistent sets of equations correspond to physically real universes. See, how big is the universe? And why does anything exist? But how do parallel universes explain why this universe is made for life? The Anthropic Principle the existence of other universes, by itself, does not explain why the universe we are in is finely tuned to support life. To get there we need one extra ingredient, the anthropic principle. This term was coined by Brandon Carter in his 1974 paper detailing the coincidences in cosmology, but the idea predates this. Quote. My Princeton colleague, Robert Dick, expressed it this way, what good is a universe without somebody around to look at it? End quote. John Archibald Wheeler in From the Big Bang to the Big Crunch, 2004 The places where life is possible may be few and far between. But wherever life exists, it is only found in places where it is possible for life to exist. This applies whether it is in a life-possible universe, on a hospitable planet, or by a pool of water in a vast desert. The anthropic principle is the self-evident truth that life only finds itself in places compatible with its existence. Therefore, it's no surprise we find ourselves in a universe having a rare combination of life-friendly laws, so long as the number of universes is large enough. Quote, the analogy here is of a ready-made clothes shop. If there is a large stock of clothing, you're not surprised to find a suit that fits. If there are many universes, each governed by a differing set of numbers, there will be one where there is a particular set of numbers suitable to life. We are in that one. End quote. Sir Martin Rees in Why Is There Life? 2000.